as we continue to see the shakeout of these crypto lenders, I mean, what, what's the talk in DC about how to handle crypto regulation? Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Um, it, there is a lot of questions happening right now, both on Capitol Hill and within the regulators about what happened and what can we do going forward? And I think this is the biggest issue right now is a lot of folks are kind of scrambling their heads saying, is there anything that we could have done, whether it be through legislation or regulation that could have prevented a situation like Celsius? Now, that is a very typical thing to happen here in D.C. is a lot of folks are just looking a either who to blame or who to bring in or who to have these conversations with. I know we've had some very um, in-depth conversations with both the House Financial Services Committee as well as the Senate Banking Committee about Celsius, about Terra. You know, I will say the one difference, though, between Terra, you know, Three Arrows, and as well, as well as Celsius is that Celsius for uh, quite some time in D.C. was getting a pretty bad rep. There, was always, there were already rumors circulating, even dating back to earlier this year, of folks saying, we should be keeping an eye on Celsius. There's some concerns about they not be uh, all that they're cracked up to be. They might be in violation of securities law. Um, they might not have money transmissions license. So there's a lot of things that on the regulatory front were yeah. already eye-opening for a bunch of the regulators. So this is nothing new, honestly, that we uh, didn't expect. But of course, it happened a lot faster than we thought. You know, Ron, it, it, it's nothing new. But here's the thing is that the the collapse of Terra was exactly the sort of thing that worried uh, lawmakers and regulators in, in terms of affecting companies like Celsius that they had questions about. In other words, this was the exact worst case scenario that was happening. And that for, for a long time, as long as crypto was moving up or rallying and, and, and people were getting into it, kind of like in many ways, the way Ponzi schemes work, where people put money in, they get money out until there's, until there's nothing left. Um, you know, you, you, you had this thing where, where people were like, well, don't worry about it. Leave us alone. This, this, we're fine. We're fine regulated and, and everything's OK. This was the worst case scenario that they were worried about. So now you have all these bankruptcies, this chain reaction uh, uh, in, in a system that uh, was supposed to avoid all this. So do you have all these bankruptcies worrying Congress? Are they now putting more pressure on you? Uh, do you see more pressure on Congress to get something done, uh, particularly now? Yes, definitely. And I think it, it's really unfortunate that right when we're having really good conversations, and again, I've worked in crypto policy uh, day back to Capitol Hill in 2017, 2016. So to see how this space has evolved so rapidly and the education level is just the point now, we're at the precipice of legislation likely passing in 2023, but even now, there's still a dangerous point where there's a lot of educated members of Congress on both sides of the issue who are looking to engage on this. And the main catalyst for this, uh, you know, in desire to engage has been the retail investor being harmed. Uh, the retail investors, at least from the Ripple case, didn't really resonate as much with Capitol Hill. I think it was just more early on, and that was one of the more earlier enforcement actions in this space. Uh, but this in particular, there, we've seen a lot of media and narratives around folks being harmed. Uh, we've also seen retail investors really getting screwed over on a lot of these interest accounts that uh, Celsius had. And additionally, there's been a lot of folks uh, in more of the underserved communities that have been so welcoming to, uh, to crypto and digital assets and NFTs and more who are now being harmed uh, significantly, at least with they put a lot of investment in and it's not as good as it used to be uh, value wise. And so a so, lot of Democrat lawmakers especially are saying, you know, while it's great that the underserved communities uh, have been coming into the crypto space, when it's a bear market, this is a terrible time. And so now the, the criticisms that we're facing is that these folks are more harmed than uh, they otherwise would have been. So well, there's a lot it, of political pressure right now. Yeah, it, it wasn't just a bear market. Right. A bear market happens all the time in, in, in equities and, and what have you. This was a collapse of several institutions where people literally can't get their money out, even if they had positive numbers in their accounts. So this is, a, you know, a, you have a lot of lobbyists and that are pushing for, if not deregulation, at least soft regulation um, in the crypto industry, this is the sort of thing where it's like, well, you know what, we could take care of ourselves. We're grown ups and everyone's a grown up. And this is all about control of your own money. Um, it's you, but yet you have billions of dollars that are lost. A lot of retail, as you said, a lot of retail investors affected who weren't protected by regulators, who weren't protected by uh, or, or at least some sort of regulation. So now what do you do? What do you what kind of what kind of answers do you give Congress and regulators when they say, hey, what are you doing? You know, what what did you guys do wrong 
that, that led to all these people to not get their money back. Yeah, and I think that's the lack of inaction, or it's more just the inaction happening here in D.C. And I think a lot of that has been through Congress, just not asserting its dominance and its role as the legislator to make sure that there are uh, bills on either securities law, uh, so, bankruptcy protection, more that do apply to this. But I'll say, you know, to, to your, more, your point about like, at least what the lobbyists are uh, proposing, as well as the advocates here in D.C., you know, we're asking for regulation because this is really important as an industry to make sure that we are a mature, functioning, uh, and the future industry in finance. And we need to have those rules and regulations in place, which can these just do not exist right now, or they just need to be tweaked here and there to make sure they uh, can accompany the technology and all the advances that it has. And so, again, we're not was, calling for deregulation. Celsius, so, go ahead. Was Celsius involved in the Blockchain Association at all? No, actually, they not. They, they applied, okay, but yeah. we uh, did not accept them. So I think this is right. something that, again, these rumors were going around for quite some time in D.C. There was a lot of concerns about these folks. But, but nonetheless, when, when you had when you had all these concerns, I mean, like, why hasn't the industry itself called out the the questionable players? I mean, there's been a kind of a reluctance, it seems, for the industry to say, hey, we have some people who aren't behaving. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to name a particular stable coin that won't reveal what's on its on its balance sheet. But there's a stable coin that won't reveal what's on its balance sheet at least with any particular detail, a couple of them actually. And yet it seems like the industry won't call them out. It seems like the industry won't police itself. And it's almost like they're depending on Congress and regulators to do it for them. And, and so at, at what point do you say, hey, you know what, we kind of also have to have a responsibility to do this? No, I totally agree. And I think that's actually, um, you know, one of the issues with the narrative here is that there has been a lack of calling out uh, bad actors in this space from the industry. At least that's resonated up to the D.C. level. Mind you, again, there's a lot going on here in D.C. It is election year. It is January 6th hearings, guns, abortion, so many issues. But, you know, these issues do permeate up to D.C. and crypto uh, very, very much, again, especially in the Celsius and Terra case. Um, but in the case that you mentioned that stable coin that probably isn't showing uh, the reserves there, Believe me, there are folks in D.C. that are that, that do see that. Um, you know, we used to have only two or three members of Congress engaged on these issues. It's now several dozen. Um, I had conversations with um, folks today in the Senate, or sorry, yesterday in the Senate about Celsius. Whether you know, was it a security? Were the interest accounts uh, securities? Um, so these are questions that are still being um, decided on right now. And there's a lot of legislation on the stablecoin front and in the securities law space that's being worked on right now. Um, some of it could be bipartisan. Some of it might be partisan. Um, but these uh, certain market actions happening right now are directly affecting these legislation uh, drafts are in the works. So uh, in the meantime, though, what's going to happen is with Congress having a really short runway. Again, we have about five weeks left of them actually being here in D.C. before the uh, election season. The regulators are going to step in. Uh, and I think we're going to see a pretty hefty uh, enforcement division from the SEC get involved. Uh, there's a hearing actually next week, next Tuesday, the House Financial Service Committee about the SEC enforcement division. And I can bet you half of the conversation is going to be around crypto. You're going to see some stuff about ESG, some stuff about uh, some accounting principles, but you will see a heavy focus um, from uh, Congress on the uh, on crypto and what the SEC should be doing more of. So expect a pretty aggressive SEC. Um, and if the Republicans do take back the House and the Senate, they'll probably have some pressure on the regulation by enforcement uh, regime, at least at the SEC. But you know, our message to the SEC is also there's a lot of low-hanging fruit here. You know, you're going after a lot of the most legitimate companies that are U.S. backed, and that is setting the tone. Like Coinbase, for example, that sets a tone for the rest of the industry. Uh, whereas there's a lot of foreign companies and a lot of bad actors that they're not going after, and it's really easy for them to get these wins in court to go after these bad folks. Uh, but they just haven't do done that. Their approach has been totally different. So we hope that they do shift the tactics a little bit to make sure they do go after the really bad players and those who are really seeking to work with the regulators. Um, find some way to at least have a good conversation and make sure that they can have uh, proper policing and regulation that doesn't kill the industry or these products that they're offering for, again, the most legitimate U.S. batch companies. Do you have a sense of, you mentioned enforcement actions, do you have any sense of the detail of, you know, what that might look like for Celsius and for other crypto lenders? Well, they're definitely having, uh, they've reached out to you know, several organizations about Celsius, uh, about Terra. So these conversations are definitely happening. You also got to keep in uh, consideration that the White House is working on an executive order. And regardless of which agency we're going to, these conversations about Celsius and Terra come up all the time, even if there's not really a tangential relation to that agency in particular, uh, jurisdiction wise. It's just that they're always monitoring and they're saying, what the hell happened? And so that's where, you know, again, we're kind of letting them know what the playbook is, we know what's happening here in the market. 
And uh, it's a pretty critical time. It's really unfortunate that we're going through a lot of these uh, contagion effects right now in the industry because this is a pretty pivotal moment in D.C. where we've really spent years getting to the point of education for a lot of these members of Congress and the regulators. And now it's going to be heavily tainted by the market uh, things, which is probably good, though, because it's good to have these, uh, these uh, guardrails and safeguards for consumers well, especially. Except that contagion effect was, you know, you can almost say predicted. I mean, it, this was consistently the problem that, that everyone has been, that the critics have been saying all along that, hey, these guys have not been behaving and that too many of the companies, it's not a decentralized world. Too many, there's too much overlap. There's too much interconnectivity between certain uh, institutional uh, funds and structures and what have you. That this hasn't been this uh, democratization of money that it was supposed to be. If you read the white paper, it's it's a it's actually fairly centralized. I mean, like, the, wouldn't you say that this is sort of? I, I mean, isn't it a, more of a reckoning for the industry itself to say, hey, what are we doing? I hope it is. And then again, we are having these conversations internally at the Blockchain Association with all of our members, having them come in, talk about risk practices, communication, as well as uh, you know, lobbying efforts for both the regulators and both for the Hill. Uh, and again, transparency is very, very important. That's the ethos of this uh, community as a self in crypto. It's just we want to be transparent, open source as much as possible. And I think that's where we're seeing a boon in DeFi right now is that they really did hold its own, uh, at least for the, right, for the moment. And really shown that what is important about uh, DeFi going forward. And again, we see the centralized more entities that you were referring to having a lot of issues. Um, and there's now a lot of calls saying, what can we do to prevent that? Uh, so again, uh, right now, at least in my conversations this week, it's been mostly securities law that's been uh, on Capitol Hill. Stable coins is still going to probably be the first thing that, that DC tackles. Uh, we can see some development probably pretty soon on that front. And most of that is targeted at Tether, candidly. Uh, it's the idea of and we've seen some of that with Terra as well, but it's mostly around Tether uh, and their disclosures, uh, audits and reserves. But uh, we're still a little farther out. I mean, DC is pretty slow to act, but sometimes we don't. That's pretty good. We want to make sure they have informed policy decisions and not be reactive to just you know, what's happening at that week. Of, because in this space, it evolves so rapidly and so much. So it's important to have uh, well-educated members of Congress and policymakers, but at the same time, take a really good candid uh overall approach here. And I think we're going to see uh, a good consensus of bipartisan support of these safe guardrails here. Uh, and my only plea to the industry here is, uh, you know, there's a lot of folks calling for, you know, deregulation or calling for uh, no regulation whatsoever. And my, you know, our opinion is, look, this is what happens when you need to have mature markets. You need to have regulation. You want to get that Bitcoin spot ETF approved. You need to have, uh, you know, the, the SEC said you have some regulations. We disagree. Right. But I think that, you know, having and more institutional uh, vehicles such as that and others will be really helpful for the industry going forward to be a lot more into the mainstream and legitimize uh, for those last holdouts out there uh, in the judicial finance space.